Welcome to Design for Musicians, my little part of the internet where I'm documenting some conversations that I have with designers in the music industry. And in this episode, I'm talking to Thomas Robson, the artist behind Biffy Clyro's latest album covers for A Celebration of Endings and the soon to be released The Myth of the Happily Ever After. Now, in this conversation, Thomas goes in depth in those projects, both with his approach to the designs and his experience working with the band. We also talk about some of his other experience working in the music industry, as well as his approach to work in general, mixing both digital and physical mediums to achieve his style, and the importance of working on the right projects and collaborating with other creative minds. This is a really interesting conversation and I got tons out of it, so I hope you do too. Enjoy. Well, thank you for, for taking some time to to talk to me because I know it was pretty much just a cold email, a cold reach out and, you know, you didn't know who I was. So thanks for agreeing to jump on a call. Well, Ryan, I think it's important that the, the more designers, artists talk together, I think the stronger we are collectively. So the, the more dissemination and, and spread of practice and talking and discussing, I think it's better for all of us. Me too. And I think... I've only really just started doing this, reaching out to people that I admire and I'm getting mi- mixed results. But when I do get those few positive trickles in it, it makes it so worth it. Um, making those connections with other designers has been has been great. Well, I think creatively, we you need to spark off ideas from things, stimuli and people as well. It's really important to, to get that mix, I think. And that's the amalgam where magic happens. Mm. Just sort of sealing yourself off, I think, doesn't work. You need to be outward looking, meeting people, experiencing new things. And from that, you derive, I think, a real creative spark. Mm. And actually, what you just touched on um, a, a few sentences ago leads really nicely into the the first question I wanted to ask you, because... Being in a similar profession to you, um, I've kind of bounced around different titles. So I've been a graphic designer, a digital designer, an artist. Um, I wonder, did you have any opinions on being a designer versus an artist? And what would be your preferred title if you had to have one? I think that's a really difficult and good question, Ryan. I think for a lot of us going through art school now, you feel quite corralled because you have to pick a particularly subject area that you're going to specialize in. Mm. But when you leave and go into the vocational world, you start to see other influences around, especially in the, if you're a designer. You're, you're coming up against all sorts of people, clients, fellow workmates. It, it's a very Catholic mix of influences, so you tend to not see yourself as a specialist ultimately after a few years i think you develop other ideas you want to explore other tracks whereas people i know who started off say doing fine art are very focused on that there's a very good reason why you need to be focused on that within the art world i think design's different because you you can take a lot of branches you have an awful lot more external stimulus probably whereas in most of my colleagues who are artists are very focused on what they do, very focused on the work. So it's probably a little bit more of an insular and a more demanding life, perhaps, than a designer where you're actually forced to interact with clients and other stimuli. So there, there, there may be two mm. tracks, but ultimately they're two tracks of the same river. It's creativity. It's mm. sitting down and being able to synthesize a problem into a visual solution. And I'm not particularly hung up on titles. It's yeah. that synthesis, I think, is the exciting bit, the magic. You can sit down 90% of the time, it's not going to work. The magic 10% of the time is pure alchemy, and that's really exciting. and doesn't need a designation. And I think also those titles tend to exclude, I think the the art world's pretty awful in that term, outsider art. It shouldn't be outsider art. Anybody can make a visual statement, and that's important. So Mm. I I don't particularly like the ghettoization. I think everybody can contribute to this moving forward. And certainly as more cultures intermingle as well, who knows where we're going? It's going to be a really interesting ride coming up. So what was your introduction into design then? How did you get into design? I ended up in in the UK, you start off doing a foundation course at art college, which is pretty much a general exposure to all of the disciplines of design and art. After that one year, you were asked to specialise I picked graphic design, which I'm not sure now whether that was a good choice or a good fit. 
But unfortunately, in those days, you were very get wise. Once you'd made that choice, you were spending three years learning to be a graphic designer. Instead of which, I think the art college would have been better going, no, there's symbiosis here. You need to go down to fine art for a couple of weeks or into furniture design or into product design, into ceramics, and actually just see where that mix takes you. So mm. I left, unfortunately, very much as a specialized graphic designer and ended up doing pure graphic design for about 18, 20 years, which, uh, again, probably as you find in your own practice, you, you, you want to look out a lot of the time. You, you're, you're competent in doing your job, but you want to look out. Another stimuli are they're on the peripheral edge of your vision. And you want to do something with that. And that's where, again, I think that breaks down this distinction. You, we've never been exposed to so much media and visual stimulus, I think, ever before in history. So all of that's firing off little synaptic connections. So it, 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 that's the really interesting part. So I think my design focus just widened. Um, mm. As it widened, I think your practice becomes more interesting because you're going to be able to do more and more people are going to be able to comment upon it. Mm. So I think if you're a designer, you really do want to just widen that exposure to other areas of the visual arts or just indeed the visual media. How have, how have you approached that? Would you go back and say, get some kind of formal education? Are you self-teaching yourself or how are you approaching going into a new area of design? I think now you, I think in my case, I think it's quite an individual thing. You would look at other practitioners, be they artists, video makers, photographers, and see what, snaps off from the traction in your mind. And because the price, the barrier of entry has gone down, technology, cameras, paints, to some, well, paints are unfortunately the only thing I think which are more expensive now. But if you see <laughs> an artist, get the brushes and the pencils out. Um, th that's where I'm moving next. I want to do a lot more painting and drawing, physical painting and drawing, and get away from the digital side of things. But I think mm. you need to keep reinventing. You need to keep trying new media because ultimately that's where the value lies, I think, and the real richness lies, and it will inform your original practice as well. It's all about developing, and I think that's how we can only move forward as designers, artists, or whatever category you want to apply to that. But yeah, it has to get away from this, I think, this formal designation of what somebody is. Everybody has a voice, and it's important that voice is allowed out without worrying about whether a designer or an artist. If they're making a good statement, that resonates with us and that's enough for me. That's the value. That's the value. And it's interesting to hear you say that you're interested in that physical form now. So physical paint, actual paint, something tangible. Um, because I'm going through something quite similar, but I always thought it might have been because I guess my education was very heavily in the digital space. And so there's almost like this romanticized view of um, physical graphic design. So actual paints versus digital painting, for example. Um, and I don't know if, if you've been exploring that physical style um, in recent works or if, if you think it's something that you're wanting to move into, but especially with the Biffy work that you did. And I think some of the work I saw on your website um, cubic pigments, I think it was called. Um, that seems to match those two styles very well in my mind. And I would consider that almost your style at the moment. But did you make an active attempt to explore that style or make that your own style? Or is this just a direction you happen to go in? I, I think it's, it's the physical mark of paint is something that we can't do digitally. I don't think you can imitate that very well. But at the same time, it's quite fun to go in and deconstruct forms of art that have existed before and juxtapose new elements. There's something quite interesting there. I don't think it's anything particularly profound, by the way, but it's interesting just to start splitting up the sort of the, the carapace which surrounds fine art and doing something different with it. And if you can combine the physical and the digital, these are very early steps. I think a lot more people are going to be doing it. And it's just, it's interesting to see what the relationships can end up on the page of the screen between the colors, the original trace elements of the fine art, and these very imposed graphic, physical paint strokes. Um, but that's now translating into a desire to do more painting. But probably like yourself, Ryan, we're all conflicted. I don't know anybody who's confident about what they do and what they put out there. 
you know you can always improve on it. So yes, you're, you're a little bit hesitant. You go into the room and you lock the door because, oh God, are my drawings good enough? Is my painting good enough? I don't know yet. And that's a process that you need, I think, to give time to develop before you come out and go, right, here's the physical painting. I've now gone back to charcoal, oil, pencil. Mm. Because it takes a bit of time for your own confidence to build. And there, there's some physical skills as well with the manipulation of materials you need to do. But it returns to this important thing. We are conflicted, I think as designers, artists, or visual people. It, it, it's hard to know, oh, that's done. You always know you can improve upon things. Mm. Do you think it's important for a designer to have a style that they're known for? Or do you think the opposite, that anyone could you know, explore multiple styles and, and have that be okay? I think that's a bit arbitrary at the beginning. I think... Some people will have a very developed style and invest a lot of time and that will be their style for others. And it doesn't diminish it. it you, you, you can have a, a wider perspective and go, well, one day I'm going to be doing drawing. I work in the digital space as well. I'll do some photography. I'll do some video. And again, I'm very, sometimes I get worried about the categorization, the narrowing of the field. If you're a specialist and that's your voice, absolutely fantastic. But for other people, we need to navigate in a different way. There's space mm. for everybody. So, you, I, I, you know, I, I can completely understand why some people are specialists and that's their style and, and that will be it forevermore. Other people probably, like myself, you want to sh shotgun yourself about a little bit more, discover more. I'm not yet ready to go, I find a style that I'm wildly happy with. I mm. want to explore more and develop more. I'm not ready to go and sort of specialise in just one area because the fun still at the moment for me is finding out that exciting aesthetic solution, which may come from a range of material other than just one specialised, this is my style, and I'm locking myself down to it. I'm not ready to do that yet. But as I say, that's not to diminish people who have a very distinctive style and that's their thing. There's room for all of us, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's really nice to hear you say that, though, because I think that kind of, um, I don't know if that would be the general consensus or that's not the right way of wording it. But I think a lot of the feedback I would get on my own work is that it it lacks a, a distinct style, for example. Like maybe it looks like it was designed by uh, multiple designers rather than one person. And I think I've, as I've designed, I've kind of just gone with what I thought suited that work the best, maybe tried some different techniques. And I've always thought, felt okay doing it, but it's nice to hear other people's opinions on how you approach your work, for example. Well, I, I think it goes back to that thing that if you're lucky and very confident, you will have your style and that will be your style for, and you will develop that and you'll be lucky. Maybe you get a gallerist who's interested in that and you'll get the support from that. Hmm. For, the, for the, the majority of us who are still conflicted, I think there has to be an element of searching. There has to be an element of development. And because we're trying to strive to do something better in your all of the time, what you're talking about is a byproduct of that search. You're on hmm. a journey. It will take you somewhere. It may not have arrived yet, but you're on that journey. Yeah. And it could be a long journey. <laughs> well, hopefully a long journey. Well, I, I think if you're interested in the visual arts, it should be a lifetime's journey because you yeah. start, you know, again, returning to my generation didn't go up, grow up in the digital world. Your generation has. You have a cornea copy of stimuli. We didn't. Mm. Um, it's probably to some degree why I would still be using a bit of collage in my work. You know, that was the traditional medium, physical materials. But you live in a world where everything's available and I think part of that, the reaction to that has to be development and experiment. And again, that allows people from a wide range, not, oh, I've been to art college or I'm a designer or I'm an artist. No, if you see something that you think can, you can develop visually and it takes you to a point where you've produced a piece of work that speaks to you, I think that's the outcome we all want. Not mm. ghettoization, characterization, or the worst of all, feeling oh, um, I shouldn't do anything because people are telling me it's not there yet. Well, it's not supposed to be there yet. It's a developmental journey. And if it was there yet, you'd probably, and let's crudely put it because money is important, you'd be charging a lot more. Yep, agreed. And you can um, only, I think, get to the 
to the point that you want to be. And it's important that you're happy with the creative outcomes if you experiment and if you drive up new and interesting and untried roads. That will mm. take you to somewhere new. And that's where we want to be because in that new place, again, that's where the creative alchemy will take place and something new will come out that you're going to be happy with and your client is going, right, Ryan, that's it. That's distinctive. I'll have a bit more of that. Mm -hmm. And I really like the point about it feeling right for you as well. Like you're doing this exploration and if you make something that speaks to you, that's something you can explore further if you want and trusting your own instincts almost. Well, I think in a commercial brief for a commercial client, you are probably given a very good brief. You know what you need to produce. The client knows what they want. That's the relationship between you and the client on a commercial basis. Mm. If you're talking about the more free-form artistic endeavor, you're the client. Yeah. And that becomes an interesting dynamic. And sometimes that is going to result in an inarticulate outcome because you're, you're, you're wearing two heads. You're the producer and the client. But again, mm -hmm. all of that is a process, and that's a process that drives you forward through experimentation. The worst thing I think that anybody can do is just stop and worry too much. No, don't. Being conflicted is part of the process, and you yeah. should be conflicted most of the time. If you've done a piece of work and you're looking at it and you think you can't improve, there's something wrong, to my mind. Mm -hmm. That's reassuring to hear, I must say. <laughs> No, it is. I, I think creatively, if we are honest, most of the work we do will not lead to a point where we're happy with it. We know it's not working. Mm. But it's the small percentage of stuff that we, you, you can look at and go, yeah, that was good. I'm glad I did that. That's, that's a visual solution I'm happy with. Mm -hmm. I, I would say 80 or 90% of the work's not there, but the 10% that is, that's what we're after. And that's what, 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 what this struggle is about. Mm -hmm. Are you a musician? Are you, are you a music lover? or? I like music, but I'm definitely not a musician. Um, I'm right. part of that. But probably, I don't know whether it still pertains now because I'm so bloody ancient. But we were, <laughs> taught, we were taught in a very didactic, unimaginative way, music. In fact, it's a bit like games at school. Music was destroyed by the way it was taught in school to me. The, the shared recorder, that horrible, horrible... Yeah. Instrument. Yeah. Um, listening to classical music with no interpretation put around it tended to close down your interest, unfortunately, in those sort of things. Jazz was played, but not explained, or th there was no magic to it. It was just, it was so didactic. Mm. So I I was did not ever learn a, an instrument to my shame, but I like music. Right. But I think the, the interesting thing about working within the music industry is something I touched on before. It's the creative symbiosis between musicians who are creative and the visual person who's creative. It, it's, it's coming together, sharing, understanding, and trying to create that creative amalgam where you're actually both going to work towards something that you want in the end. You're talking about the traditional album. Remember, an awful lot of those iconic albums, certainly in England, are the result of art school either bands playing in art school or people in art school who knew bands. And that's mm. that. all of that process can be recreated now. It doesn't need to be an art college, but it's just creatives working together. There's been this awful, it seems, ghettoization. You're a musician, you're an artist, you're a designer, whatever else. No, you're creative. Come mm -hmm. together, it's the same language. It doesn't matter where you come from. And that will spark off these little creative sparks and lead to new work being being done. But obviously, if you're working with music, you need to get your head around what the band's doing, their artistic stance. Is it going to speak to you? Because, I mean, I've done the occasional work for music that hasn't spoken to me, and the outcome is not good. You need to have a good partnership. There has to be a creative partnership. I don't think it can be a client band, very dry, I will do a design for you without taking on board what your music is particularly. I, I yeah. don't think that, that works. It has to be a collaborative venture and it has to be an iterative venture. I don't think you can just sit down and go, bang, there's an album cover. Um, that will do you. No, it can't be. It has to be iteration. And that I think is what you're talking about in the olden days, whenever it was traditional mediums, that iteration could be done quickly. Pencil, paint, crayon, yeah. collage. 
you, you know, you could turn that around because you're physically doing it. You have actually more time to think in the assemblage. Digital's one curse is that it's too quick. I think you can uh, move stuff, resize stuff. It's far too quick. Whereas I started off using a scalpel, glue, rulers, paints, sparkers, um, and, and that slowing down of the process forces you to make other creative decisions. And there's not a lot of redundancy if you're doing it physically. If you only have one magazine for your collage, you're going to be very careful about those elements when you cut. In yeah. the digital world, you don't. You, you you become an awful lot more promiscuous. And that promiscuity, I think, is probably a, a more difficult thing to deal with than going back to the 60s where you might be sitting down using physical paints, collages, drawing, um, and you would probably have a better relationship with the band because you would physically have to be in proximity to them. Whereas now, as we're doing today, with Zoom, email, the, the world's become compressed. Mm -hmm. In past times, it wasn't compressed, so you tended to know who you were working for on a more intimate basis. And that's probably why London, New York, those big centres became the point where bands, artists and designers coalesced together because you had to coalesce together in those environments. That doesn't pertain now. So you've worked on a, f a few projects in the music industry. Um, yeah. And one thing I wanted to ask you, which I think you've, you've kind of spoken to already, was do you approach a design for a music client differently to a non-music client? And I know you've said that, you know, listening to the music and have it being collaborative and like hand in hand with, with the, with the band rather than client and designer. But is there anything else to an approach to a music project that you would do differently to um, a regular project? Well, sorry, my limited experience. I think there's, there's a very distinct demarcation line between being contacted by a DJ or a band who wants an album cover. They've seen, some of your work, Ryan, they want an album cover, but that's it. They want it probably for a price. There's no discussion. There's no creativity. I just want an album cover. I like your work. We'll do it. I would shy away from that work. That's going nowhere. And you'll probably actually in the end be undercharging for your own work. What you want is a band or a musician or a client or an agent representing them who's going to approach you and you immediately know this is going to be a creative process. Mm -hmm. They will generally say, we like this particular piece of work. We don't want it, but we want something developed from the visual language and grammar that you're using there. So you're starting from point A, you're going to point B, but it's going to be a collaborative journey and the outcome won't be known at the beginning. And you know yourself, whenever a band or a newspaper approaches you, how important it is to them, the creative response. And I would tend to shy away from people that you know aren't particularly interested in creativity. They've seen something, they want it. That, that's, it, it might be a financial outcome, but it's not going to be a creative outcome. And I don't think it's going to drive the artist, designer, visual response forward as you would want to think. Yeah. And that's really interesting to hear you say because it's, it's hitting close to home hearing you say that because yeah, I have the exact same experience of what you've just said. There's definitely a mix of projects that I've worked on. There's definitely those where you can tell the band is um, much more open to it being a process. They want to be involved. They want to talk through it. Yes. They've seen examples of my work, but it's not like a, we want a version of this one. Um, and then there is the other side of that where it's very direct and I like this one. Can I have this one or something very similar to this one? for X or as cheap as possible, usually. Um, but so do you think there is a way other than just shying away from the projects that aren't as creative? Do you think there's a way of positioning yourself then to get more of those more creative clients? I think, <clears throat> and again, it's probably a generational thing. You have a range of platforms now to get your work out, Instagram, Pinterest, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, you need to, it's a bit like sowing seeds. You need to get your work out, sow the seeds. People will see yeah. your work. The more people that see your work, the more chances that somebody's going to say, oh, creatively, there's something there that sparks a response in me. I'll contact Ryan or whoever, and we'll see where we can go with this. And it, it, it's 
those are the people that you want to get, but I don't know that there's any recipe to getting those. I, I don't know what, there, there's no magic dust that you can throw out there. And unless you're a very well-established designer or artist, people aren't necessarily going to come to you. You need to get your work out there to, to get those yeah. little magic sparks and see what comes back. Yes, if a DJ contacts you and just wants a piece of work for a hundred dollars, fair enough, that's great. But that's not where I think one wants to be. One wants to work with a creative band who are going to indulge, as I say, in a creative and iterative process. And the iterative process is very difficult. You want to be doing ten versions and have nine rejected. Number yeah. ten. Oh, there's a foundation there that we might be able to move on to something else with. That, 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 that's the work worth doing and that's the work really worth investing time in because as I said before you're going to start at point A you'll get to point B but point B you won't know for a while until you do that developmental process and that's where the interest for me lies and it's not necessarily a financial thing I don't think you want to be driven by the financial reward it's what's the actual outcome am I going to be proud of that Is it, do the band more importantly like it and does the band mm -hmm. speak to them because that's quite a complex relationship doing a design that's going to speak to a very creative group of people who are probably at the top of their game. And that process, I think, is where we as designers, artists, or whatever you want to call us, that's where we derive the value from. It's not financial, it's the creative journey. Mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely, <laughs> I think, lit a fire under me to try and get more clients like that because it, it is what I want at the end of the day. That's definitely the kind of work that I want to be doing. And I think I am... Um, if I'm being brutally honest, probably being more motivated by um, the financial side of things and just trying to get a body of work under my belt at the moment. Um, but I think if I can work on t the kind of projects that I want to do, hopefully that will attract the right kind of clients in the future. Well, I think the analogy that I'm using is you, 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 you cast your, you sow your seed, you, you sow your work, yeah. over the internet and the strangest people not strange people necessarily but <laughs> strange, the strange connections that you make are fantastic mm. yeah, I, you know, why would somebody in Switzerland be contacting me I didn't go out and de deliberately do that but that happens it's that strange mm. process that the internet allows for the strange little meandering ways that your work gets distributed, shared, floated about. And it's not every day or every week or every month, but you will start ultimately to make these very interesting connections with exactly the sort of clients that you want to, to meet. But I don't know if you can do it deliberately easily. I think that's where you need to leverage the internet to its advantage and to your advantage by just getting the work out there with no deliberate plan of marketing or whatever else, but just see what it all sparks mm. happen and who starts to feed back to you how did the, the biffy relationship start then how did how did that come about i was contacted by the band i think they'd seen some of my work um right. they we got into discussions about the, the, the new album coming out um would i like to have some thoughts about it and, it, and I said yes, um, and that became, as a, and I'm returning to it, I know it's repetitive, but I think it's important. It became a very good, creative, iterative process where you start with your first proposals. They're, they develop into something else. And so it, it, it's a constant process of refinement, and it will take time to do. But the, the great joy of working with Biffy is that they're very, very creative guys with a deep emotional attachment to their music, the lyrics, it suffuses through everything they do. So you know that when you're working with them, that the feedback that you're getting is going to lead to some interesting work being developed. And I think right from the from the go, that relationship was really valuable to me. And mm -hmm. you need to be able to take the criticism and realize that you know, the first ideas are never going to be the finished idea. And that's where if you can work with a band like Biffy, it's a godsend because they yeah. know what they want. And 
they'll also bring other people into that mix as well who know what they're talking about as well. So it, it, it returns to where we started. I think that's the value in the process. It, it, it's not financial. It has to be a creative response and it has to inform creative development. And if you've got that with a band like Biffy, it's going to be a pleasure to experience and a pleasure to do the work and a pleasure to develop a visual response. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I love about Biffy, to be honest, because I've been a, fa a fan of them for a long time, but I can just tell that they are um, very creative people and they value the visual side of the music as well. Um, but were you familiar with them before they got in touch with you? I was familiar with her music. Um, I'd seen a bit of Balance and Symmetry, the film. Um, right, yeah, yeah. And you went. Th 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 their journey is very interesting as well, and I think it touches on, you know, it's all about journeys and development. And when you look at that, you went, yeah, th th this, these guys are really very interesting because of the depth of what they do. Yeah. This isn't superficial stuff. This is very very deep mm -hmm. and that's you know th that that's an, an intimidating by the way as well as somebody outside whenever you look at that body of work how you how are you ever going to plug into that and you need to deal with that as well it's it's that response it's a finely gauged thing you don't want mm -hmm. it, it, it would be very easily to be intimidated with, with, with the quality of what biffy does how could i can contribute and that again i think it's this building of relationships and the iterative process of just let's keep working at this until we get to a solution. And you know when it's there because it will click both with yourself mm. and with the band and with the record company as well. And again, Ryan, I think it's not a financial return. It's the aesthetic and emotional return. That's the important thing of doing work like this. Um, it's really interesting to hear you say about... Um the intimidation of the previous work, because that's one thing I specifically wanted to ask you about, because I can't imagine being in that position. I'm a huge fan of a lot of the previous covers and their covers are, or their artwork around their music in general is what helped me get into this field anyway. So did you feel that pressure to kind of live up to the previous body of work? It's probably even slightly worse for me because of my age, I would grow up buying NMA and Sounds, Melody Maker, all pretty much dead now, unfortunately. The print versions, yeah. and the best album covers in those weekly music papers were by Storm Studios. Yep. And you look at Biffy's back catalog and go Storm Studios. Now, you want to run away and hide in a darkened <laughs> room because that, that is intimidating. Yeah. And, and again, it goes back to this thing. We are conflicted as visual or producers of visual responses. We have to be conflicted because that's another fuel to drive us forward. So you look at that, but at the same state, you have to you have to you have to be confident in your own voice, and your own voice has to be allowed to contribute. What's the worst going to happen? Somebody's going to say, "Well, no, that's not quite what we wanted." Well, at least you've tried, and if you don't try, what's the point? So I, yep. I, I didn't know at the beginning. It, you see Storm Studios, you see the background of the work, but there, you, you can watch a Biffy video and, and there are visual solutions in those videos, which just, again, spark your, spark your creative response. So, and that's, that's the great thing. And I guess the music is, is such an important factor to it as well. Did you get the chance to hear the songs before any work began? Did you have them as like an aid for inspiration while you were working or? What I did was listen to the back catalogue. Um, right. And strangely enough, I started to get very into the lyrics because mm -hmm. I thought the lyrics were telling some very powerful stories and they started to influence the work. I think if you, if you expose yourself too much at the beginning, there's too much input and you might come up with an incoherent response. So I wanted to have a foundation. So I looked at the back catalogue stuff and it developed from there. Obviously, with new albums, there can be a lot of um, difficulty in getting your hands on, the, on the, the fresh edits. So you need to start from somewhere. So in my case, it was looking at the back catalogue 
looking at the lyrics, looking at the visuals, and that started to inform the initial process. And as that went on, I began to get more literacy in what was happening with the new album. Right. But okay. I, I think you need to go back sometimes, just as I say, to at least get a little bit of a foundation to know what you, what, what the background is, the depth of their creativity, and that can inform your response. It would be very hard, I think, just to win cold. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the new album, bang, we want well, well, uh, what? You know, you can get lost. It's very, again, it returns to the intimidating thing. You're an outsider to that world. You haven't been invited in before. It's a complex, complex world. Mm -hmm. So you need to get some stability first. That was me looking at the back catalogue, looking at balance and symmetry, um, just as the film. I love the MGB GT. In fact, that actually, there's a little, there's a car within the film and that was a little motif, I think, which settled me down and went, yeah, we can do something here. Yeah, that's that's really interesting to hear the back catalogue as well. It's not something I would think of. Um, but I guess there was so much material there, right? It's, you, you, you can. Well, well, I think you, 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 need to, you need to find stuff which resonates with you that the band's done mm. because that will inform or help inform your response. And that's what happened with me. Um, I mm. became, you know, I'd known of Biffy, but once you started to understand the depth, that, that became very helpful. That really did become helpful because you knew that you could apply a depth to your own visual response. It, it, it didn't need to be superficial. You could do something deeper with this. And that, that was really, really valuable. And so you were talking, or when you were, say, going through the process with, with the band, it was talking directly to the band. Was it communicating directly with them? Yeah. It, 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 obviously, there, there are filter processes between the record company and the band, and that will apply probably, I think, to most major artists. So there is a, there right. is a filtering process. But yes, you have the initial creative chat. Um, and off the back of that, there was a, an initial visual response. Okay. That was commented upon. And then a process of refinement started until we moved closer and closer. Now, that's quite an involved process, Ryan. I don't want to pretend it's three versions and bang, we're done. It's not. It's, there's a lot of work in that. Um, right especially with demanding creative people. You're you're trying to plug yourself in to guys who may have spent a year, 16 months, two years planning, producing, writing, crafting an album. I think it's unrealistic to expect that you can just go in and go, right, there it is. That's the response. It isn't. It has to be this developmental thing. And mm -hmm. that's where Biffy's so useful because they are creative people. So their comments are going to be constructive creatively and that will enable you to really really assist you in developing a, a visual solution that's going to actually speak to us all and meet the requirements of, of the band and the music right oh, that's awesome um how long was that process then from start to finish i mean roughly how, how long did it take you to get from initial call to say final version I think you would. I think realistically, you'd want to leave about two or three months. Now, not constantly, but you would need to leave that sort of time because you are developing, and you need time within that. And remember, you're working with with their. There's a timetable from the record label, and there's a timetable from the band. So mm -hmm. those are the two important dates that you want to get in your diary first, because they're their deliverable dates. Mm -hmm. You work back from that. You see that space that you have and you want to fill that as much as you can. And in my case, the way I work, it would be trying to do not a multiplicity of creative responses, but a range of creative responses to narrow it down to make sure that that process of refinement in the final weeks, we know what we're doing. Um, okay. you're, going to have, you're going to be turning out very high quality artwork for print, for video and the rest of it. And that all needs to be factored in time-wise because that will will burn up quite a lot of production time. Mm -hmm. And how, how did you approach those different stages of the design, I guess? Were you using like physical mediums um, early on? Like, are you doing rough sketches early on and then it kind of becomes more high fidelity? Yeah. You do rough sketches, I think, just to get the elements floating right. I don't I, I, I don't think the digital screen's a fantastically great area to, to, to be doing relationships. I right. find that if you print stuff out, chop it up, look at it tangentially on the floor, 
you put it on the wall, catch it after you've made your tea or dinner or whatever, you start to mm. see different things. If you're just in front of the screen all of the time, it becomes, I think, a pretty visual cul-de-sac. It's better to get stuff printed out, do a bit physically, stick it up on walls and just catch it occasionally. Mm. Because it's that peripheral glance, I think, really helps inform the aesthetic balance of, of work. And then mm -hmm. that can translate ultimately into the digital screen because that ultimately is where you're going to be producing the print artwork um, for the company. Right. And so for the final design then, um, there's lots of different elements in that design overlapping. Um, how was that kind of assembled? Was that multiple physical elements kind of scanned into a digital workspace or how did that kind of come together? I would be doing collages just to get um, the, the, the color cubes fascinate me. So I'm sort of doing collages and defocusing stuff, printing them out, chopping them up with scalpels just to make those interesting colored blocks. Ah. At the same time as well, um, printing that out, overlaying that, chopping up some of the original um, uh, background elements. And again, it's, if you're working on a on a large cutting board, it's easier to start to move stuff about. And I think faster and more exciting to do that in physical medium of paper than it is on screen. And once the balances and the interrelationships start to work, that's, I think, when you can return to the screen and fine tune. Right. And again, it, the way I would work is you, you, you need that, I think, that physical, those physical elements outside of a computer to look hmm. at especially tangentially returning to it, you, you need to catch it out of the corner of your eye because that will really start to inform what's working and what's not. Mm. I find just working completely on the computer, it became arbitrary. The relationships, you started, a, a, a graphics tablet can dictate an awful lot of relationships. Mm. And I don't particularly like that. But certainly mm. you start to scale stuff down, I think, into safe areas. You start to see things within safe areas. Well, that's not necessarily what you want to be doing. You want a bit of lead and you want a bit of messing out. But they're all complementary, Ryan. But it just requires, I think that's that's my practice, just doesn't apply to everybody. But it means that again, you're 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 constantly iterating, you're constantly developing, and then that will take you to hopefully a good conclusion at the end. Mm. I love that mix, yeah, that idea of a mix of mediums. And I think it's really interesting to get that little insight there into how you you got those kind of colored squares or the pixelated areas as I would have previously described them, I guess. Um, but the, the other thing was that there was the album cover and the deluxe album covers. So there were two, two, there were two covers going in parallel, but they didn't necessarily have to be. The, the, one wasn't the mirror image of the other. And again, that process that I've been talking about, that enables you, I think, to, to, to very quickly look and review at these two separate pieces of work, which have the same language and grammar, but aesthetically are different to one another. Hmm. I haven't actually seen the deluxe one, I don't think. Is that separate to the one, the new album that's coming, The Myth of the Happily Ever After? But there's the, instant, the Instant History had a deluxe version as well. I think you'll probably still right. see it on the website for sale. But that again, just to reiterate, because you're doing, you're using the same language and grammar, but you need to produce two separate pieces of work. And that's where the physical and the digital working in, in, in close proximity to one another, I think are so useful. Mm -hmm. But just sometimes I think, especially if you're using this mix of the physical and the digital, merely doing it in the digital space starts to be a bit constraining because mm -hmm. you become aware too much, I or I do, I think of safe areas, bleed, da 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 and that can be constricting in the early days. I don't think you necessarily need that. Whereas a cutting board and a scalpel will give you a bit more freedom. Yeah. So you have a very close relationship with your printer, I would imagine. Well, that, that's the other interesting one. You, you, I have a very close relationship with the printer that I would use in London to do my fine art prints. Um, they're very good and they're very exacting and you know exactly what the artwork has to be. Um, with record companies, you'll generally be tasked with producing 300 DPI artwork. It mm. will inevitably be filtered through their, their studio, uh, wherever that is, and that will go to their chosen printer. 
So you need to be very careful when you're producing that artwork because you probably will not have a relationship with the end printer. The mm -hmm. record company will. So I think that puts another added dimension of complexity to it because you, you're not going to be able to go to the printer and go, oh, that color's not quite match. Mm -hmm. So you have to be insanely careful in color balance for your RGB and your CMYK versions. And that, again, takes a lot of time, or I think, to get right, yeah. especially the CMYK conversions. So those are things that need to be built in again to the timetable I was talking about earlier. You have your deliverables date, work back from there, but allow enough time for the actual artworking so that when you actually go into a record shop, Amazon, wherever, and you pick up the physical copy, those colors are what you want because you will not probably be able to influence the printer. Yeah, it's so important, right? Because it's, it's going to be everywhere and it needs to match. It, it, it needs to match. Um, there was a video being done in parallel with the album sleeve. You want to make sure that your RGB for television is reflective of the print version. So there is, there, there's quite a bit of tweaking there that needs to be done. Um, but the most important thing for me within that process is you need to allow yourself enough time to do that because you could really come a cropper if you're just converting your RGB file to CMYK <laughs> without much of a thought and then go, those reds or browns. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, the blues have gone green. Uh, and that's a, that, that, that's a little bit of a panic and a pressure, I have to admit, because you are sort of hoping, you know, you'll, you'll send color references, everything else, even the gamma of your own screen, you know, oh, is this going to be right for the printer? You don't yeah. know. So that's where a, a lot of time, I think, ultimately towards the conclusion is spent trying to get that artwork as, as made as well as you can. So you can actually, as soon as you we transfer it, you're going, I couldn't have produced that artwork color-wise more accurately than I've done, and hopefully the printer will will be able to work with that. Mm -hmm. there would be no problems touch wood so far. Mm -hmm. um, certainly another, it, it is another very important thing to bear in mind. Certainly yeah. when I did some of the earlier and the cheaper music work I did, you could see some awful printing, you really could. And you had no control over it because you were doing stuff at very low cost. And the results really were pretty awful. With everything that's been said so far, then, one question I had was with this new album that's coming out, the cover is in a very similar vein to a celebration of endings. Were they all done at the same time or no. they weren't? Um, okay. About a year after Instant History, I was contacted again. Um, and the, the brief was a developmental one. It was, we've been there, we want a development, we want to improve. And here again, here's the background to the work which we've been doing over the last year. What's his response to that? What can we do? And again, the iterative process started pretty much in the same vein as before. So we've moved on, I think. I think it's an improved version of where we were before. And that returns me to what I was saying earlier that these creative journeys have to take you to new spaces and test you and make new things happen. And that's what's happened again this time. Mm. It's these creative catalysts drive the whole process forward. You don't start with knowing what necessarily what the outcome is going to be, but the outcome at the end is going to be what the band wants and what you as a, a designer, artist, visual responder are mm. happy with as well. Well, I'm really excited to see the new work come out and see the additional visuals that are around it as well. Did, how involved were you actually with the, I guess, with the artwork outside of the cover? Because there's obviously so much extra packaging, I guess, especially around the deluxe editions and stuff. There's so much media there. Were you involved in a lot of that too, or? No, that's, that, I, I'm not sure who's responsible for that. Warner, Warner Brothers, who are Biffy's label at present, they have a Warner Brothers studio, so they'll be doing some of that as well. Right. Um, I'm not invited to participate within that, and I don't, I, I, I do what I do, and that hopefully informs the, the other stuff around. And remember, the, if the band are rehearsing and on tour and everything else, the, the, the communication dynamic as well has to be managed, so it could be difficult. Yeah. just as a solo person to be reacting as quickly as the band would want. As you say, there's a multiplicity of design work and artwork being done and as a single person realistically, and it's important as as a single person to say, well, no, I can't do that within the time scale. There's just yeah. too much. 
It'd be lovely to do the animation, but I don't have the equipment and I certainly would not have the time to do it. Yeah. Um, so you need to be responsible enough and what your your own area of expertise is and do that and not get distracted or sidetracked because what's going to happen there is you're going to produce weak product, which is not going to satisfy the band. It's not going to be a good enough creative response. And that's what they want from you. And so... As, let's say, I'm just going to take the example of um, like a deluxe box set, for example, because that's something I've seen where, you know, there's the display image of all the different things that are part of this package. And they all obviously stem from the visual of the cover art. Are you kind of shown any of this, even if you're not directly involved in actually designing it? Is there any kind of here's the direction we're going in? Is, does this complement the cover in the right way or are you completely separated from the point of delivering the cover? It's a little bit of both. Um, okay. It, 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 it's a little bit of both, but ultimately there will be a volume of work which is informed again by the, the, the language and grammar of the cover. That that's As long as that's followed, I think you don't need to be... You, you have confidence. It's returns to where we were. You're working with very creative people you're doing very creative work. That's the trust that you have, that you know things are not going to be diminished. So there's a comfort zone. There's a comfort zone around that, that you know the threshold of quality is not going to dip. It is going to be okay. maintained. You're not an island. You have to, you know, you, 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 you have to be absolutely cognizant of the fact that this you are involved in a creative circle of people now mm-hmm. and accept that. You feed into that, that circle produces something which I think is of real value. And that's that, that's that's the outcome. It, 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 you don't want to get hung up too much or too precious. Right. Or you're not going to get to where you want to go, be. You know, there, there are other professionals involved in this process who are very, very good at what they do, insanely creative. And to be involved in that mix, that's the outcome you want. Yeah. Not to be worried about crossing every T and dot. And remember, because the band's so creative, they're developing all of the time as well. There is a creative dynamic run through this. It's not produce the album that stops. Mm-hmm. That's an ongoing process, and you have to be aware of that. So things will develop and change, mm-hmm. and other things will start to happen. And that, that for me, is exciting without worrying yeah. too much, as you say, about the details. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am part of a... Uh, Biffy Claro fan group on Facebook. There's some really great creative people in there. It's actually a really nice community to be part of. Um, and when I was setting up this uh, call, I just reached out to them and said, hey, I'm going to be talking to the person who was in charge of the, visual, uh, the cover art for the last few releases. Um, do you have any questions for them, for him? So I got a couple of, I mean, a lot of the questions that I got from them have kind of informed some of the questions that I've asked already. But here's a couple of kind of smaller ones that I wanted to see what your answers were. Um, so one of them, I don't have any names attached to these, but one of them is, uh, is there any significance to the paintings that were chosen for the covers? So I think in this context, it means the paintings of the people. Yes, well... Aesthetically, they have to be attractive and the background history of those images is of interest to me. The way that we read traditional fine art, that that very formalized structure about how we're supposed to react to it, I think is capable of reinterrogation at the moment and that interests me. What happens if you actually take it out of the frame, juxtapose it with other elements? That starts to get interesting as opposed to going into the traditional gallery experience and you must read these pictures as we this is the didactic manner in which these pictures must be read well let's liberate these images from that and see what we can do with these juxtapositions of elements of of, of color and of texture and just see what happens are there new narratives that can be formed from them as opposed to their original framing and so was there any reason for those paintings in particular was there any reason why you landed on those ones or the, the, the aesthetics play a, a part right they you want to be looking at them and going right does 
does that person originally communicate something to me? Yes, it does. Okay. Are the colors interesting? Yes, the colors are interesting. What can I do? Okay. Because I think it's really interesting because I think a lot of the questions I get about the cover is like, who is that person? There's a lot of interest for knowing who that is, you know, because especially with the, the eyes being covered as well, it's almost like a mystery. There's a shroud to whoever that is. Well, I think that's part of it. It's part of this reinterrogation. It's part of this taking the picture out of the frame, putting new boundaries around it. What is it? Mm. It's supposed to spark a reaction. It's supposed to spark that. Um, I'm glad it's actually successfully doing that. That's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to raise questions. Then the next time you look at something similar, you can start to reinterrogate and re-question it. Yep. It definitely is. It definitely is getting that reaction. So mission accomplished. Especially a lot of these pictures, remember, societally are very, very defined. These are very rich, generally very privileged people that were taken out of the frames and doing something different with. It's this reinterrogation really interests me to write, I think, all of my work. It's juxtaposing, it's moving, it's shifting, it's changing meaning and mm. raising questions. And I think that's interesting. It doesn't have to necessarily be the one to find answer, but if it raises questions, that's interesting. Can yeah. Be. What's definitely. going on here? What's it about? That was definitely my reaction when I first saw it as well. I remember when it was first revealed, and I, I think my first reaction was just, what is this? And actually, um, one of the questions that I got from the group was just, what is it? That was it, those three questions, what is it? Because they just, I think there's so much mystery around it. Um, that they're just left to, you know, everyone's left to interpret it, which is what I, I, I really like about it. Well, well, well you, you can see the interesting dynamic. Um, it's the deframing, it's the reinterrogation, it's the representation of different elements. It's raising the question, what comes out of that? Look at the instant history video. Mm. That was a response to the album. It's there, the magic, the, the magic dust's in there somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. So watch that video, look at the album cover. That's something which has informed something. And the video is going off in another direction, but the colors, the cubes, the palettes there. That, mm -hmm. That's what it's designed to do. There's not a specifically defined outcome at the beginning, apart okay. from this raising of questions and the, the visual reinterrogation of, of the fine art imagery. Love it. I love it. Um, one last one. Um, is there any significance or reason behind the color of the paint? So blue, was blue chosen for a specific reason for Celebration of Endings and red for the myth of the happily ever after? The original blue was, I liked it at the beginning. It was part of the iterations that were done, the, the, the visual responses that were done initially. It became, there wasn't a wide, there wasn't an infinite range of color, but there were various suggestions. I particularly liked that one because I thought the relationship between it and the other elements was very strong. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier, um, Ryan, you, that's where the magic is in this process. You, 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 you're not going to get it right straight off, but when it happens, it clicks. And that color clicked. Um, mm. And the band liked it. That resonated with them. With the latest cover, and again, that's why it's interesting working with Biffy is if, if you listen, start to listen to the lyrics, the red was probably the palette that was more in simpatico with, with where we've been and what we've been saying and what the band's saying. And it was, again, one of the iterations done, but the red began to find a voice of its own. And that's what we've gone with, the red. Okay. It, it, it's 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 giving space for these voices, these elements to, to, to find their voice, for the band to say, yeah, that's beginning to communicate. And that's and the red became the developmental color. Mm -hmm. And it went through various forms as well until we got that particular shade, which has taken mm -hmm. a bit of time to do as well. And I'm guessing you actually painted those. Yeah. How many different versions of that stroke of paint did you go through? <laughs> There's quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You use a lot of paint. Yeah. 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 Um, but, but I think, again, this is where we were at the beginning. You know, we've talked about it before. It's 
you need to get stuff off of the computer. You need to start chopping stuff up. You need to start playing around with stuff. That's that's where you will start to develop and find some quite interesting juxtapositions, I think. And it, you, you can sit down with a copy of any magazine today and just slice out 20 pages, cut them in two, and start to make the slices work together, and you're going to come up with something quite interesting. It's all about reinterrogating what what we see, repositioning it, juxtaposing it, and seeing if there's a voice there that we can that resonates with us. I love that, and I think that's it's definitely inspiring me to get off the computer a bit and try something physical and and try some of those methods because they sound really interesting. It's a bit like sitting in front of the television and just reusing the remote control to blip through the channels. You get some really quite interesting stuff going on as you blip between various forms and narratives. Right, right, right. You know, it's that, and we're, we're exposed to so much visual material at the moment. I think interesting stuff happens at the interface between one image and the other, especially if you start to bring those images together in new juxtapositions. That, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I must say I'm I'm a huge fan of the cover, which is why what led me to reach out to you in the first place. So I, I just wanted to say you've done a, a, a great piece of work. It's really awesome. And I think the the reaction it's getting from the community, or at least the small section of the community that I'm in, is is really great to see. And just being able to digest cover art is probably one of my favorite things to do, to look into these things in so much detail. So thanks for, you know, taking some time to talk through it and explain a little bit about it. Well, well Ryan, returning to it, I think you're the guy who's, who's, who's the, the, the prime mover here. The praise needs to be directed to you. What you're doing is insanely valuable. I think this dissemination sharing of practice is just so valuable. I wish I had it when I was growing up. Um, mm. It, it will go out there on the internet and it's going to really help some, I, I'm sure it's going to help people actually find their own visual voice. And that's, as I say, just so critically important, I think, at the moment in the world I where so. you can see media without question and without comment. Well, I hope so. That's the goal. Um, and, you know, the more of these conversations that can happen, the better. And yeah, let's get this information out and hopefully inspire someone to create something for themselves. Right, Ron. Um, one last thing then. Uh, I like to just end every chat with this question. Um, but what are you listening to at the moment? Is there anything that you're really into? And if you were to recommend me an album, can you recommend me something? Because I, I want to listen to something new. It's going to be really sad. I'm rediscovering 80s music again and 70s <laughs> music. <laughs> so get off and get some T Rex. T Rex, okay. Yeah. Any particular album or? No, I think the T-Rex singles at the moment, I, I, I purchased a few old copies of NME from the 70s um, and was mm-hmm. just flicking through the pages again and just remembering the music. And uh, you look back on it now and you go, actually, just that that strange pivot point when punk arrived on the scene, 76, 77, there was so much interesting stuff going on. And it's pretty raw compared to what you hear today. Mm. Yeah, um, rediscovering Eddie and the Hot Rods, Teenage Depression, uh, just brilliant. That's awesome. I'd heard of T Rex, but I haven't heard of Eddie and the Hot Rods. Oh, Eddie and oh God, Teenage Depression, disseminated it, Ryan. Brilliant track. That is definitely going on the list. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. There were a whole lot of um, Southern English London bands suddenly exploded around '75. To about 78, not the major punk ones, but really good. Probably background in RNB, Dr. Feelgood was obviously talking about then as well. But London was an absolutely bopping place with mm. these consummate blues trained musicians belting it out around Covent Garden. Absolutely marvelous times. So, Eddie and the Hot Rods, worth a discovery. Definitely. No, thank you. I'm going to jump on that right away. Thanks. Um, Okay, I'm just going to end the recording here in a second, but then, uh, you know, we can just... Well, well, sorry about the garden background. That's a bit of a bollocks. Um, but anyway, hey ho. <laughs> That's okay. But thank you. Thank you once again for taking the time to chat to me. I really appreciate well, it. I'm being repetitive, Ryan. It's you who needs to be thanked because what you're doing, I think, is of insane value. Uh, I know I've said that before. It is repetitive, but it is important to say it. Awesome. Thank you. 
Thanks for thanking me. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. If you want to find Thomas online or see some more of his work, there's going to be some links around wherever you're watching or listening to this, as well as links to Thomas's music recommendations. So if you want to give some T-Rex or Eddie and the Hot Rods a listen, then go for it. But that's it from me, really. So all that's left for me to do is say goodbye, and I'll hopefully see you in the next episode. See ya.